previously in Nomi Factory in Minecraft. I had painstakingly farmed the Iridium element and several nether stars in a brutal lunar war. All of this was done in preparation for today's gaming, in which I shall synthesize the quantum computer from several more techno babble items, leading up to the assembling of the assembly line, which will assemble our first ludicrous air trinkets, pushing us further towards the fusion reactor. But all of this would come at the ultimate price. But first, since mostly every electronic related thing from now on needed a clean room, I was planning to expand the dimensions of the current cleanroom 2.0 to a 11 by 4 by 11 cleanroom 3.0. According to NASA calculations, this would cost hundreds of plascrete and hundreds of filter vents. So it was time to get to work mixing several kilotons of cement, creating false Daffian amounts of steel, combining them with molten concrete and polyethylene, and combining them with even more steel parts and medium voltage parts. And rinse and repeat until I had all the building materials. Next I destroyed the roof and 2.4 walls of the clean room 2.0. This allowed me to then extend the clean room to new sizes never seen before, because it was not done before. This created an unprecedented amount of area that was fit for clean room operations. But this also meant it was time to destroy everything inside so I can recreate the electronics factory but five times better. Due to several mistakes I explained in the previous episode, the old system had a 50% chance of clogging up the assembler if I tried auto-crafting too many circuits at the same time. And I would need a setup to automate making nano CPUs not only for nano circuits, but also for making quantum CPUs. Notable mention. I would need to automate extreme circuit boards as well for the quantum circuits. So it was time to do all of the above. The first extremely annoying and enraging issue to solve is that each circuit needed molten tin to become existent. The old system for dealing with this was that each auto-crafting task would send one tin ingot to this fluent extractor for every single circuit to be made. Which was dawdling. But I now had a foremost realization. Since this molten tin is ubiquitously used everywhere, there is nothing wrong with having the system automatically export tin to be moltenized automatically rather than on demand. And since tin is no longer needed on demand, this could only mean one thing. I forcefully seized the interface containing all the circuit patterns. And I gave each pattern a memory wipe so that I could reprogram all of them without any memory of tin. This was then put back inside the circuit crafting interface, which was put under the circuit assembler, which was drinking all of the molten tin it could ever need made by the extractor beforehand. I then trapped a machine hull into the walls of my room, so that I could link the matter energy system with the interface inside the clean room. Now that I had circuit assembling reborn, it was time to upgrade the electronics cutting system. Currently I was using lubricant instead of water to lacerate substances. But I was very slowly running out of lubricant, which was extremely bad. The old source of lubricant was destroying thousands of fish by stuffing them in extractors and distilling the resulting bodily fluids for lubricant. But I had a far better method that was far more expensive but would give more rewards. And it comes from coal. Currently I was still pyrolyzing coal to extract phenol for epoxy resin. But now I shall use even more coal by pyrolyzing it but in a different way, this time to get coal tar rather than phenol. This required a second pyrolyze oven, which I made from crafting 16 cupro nickel coils, some iron machine hulls with lead cables sprinkled on top, some input and output hatches, and the oven controller itself. Now it was time to build it in the coal processing quadrant of the distillation floor of the station. Now that coal was being imported and coal tar was being cooked, I returned to the base terminal and began using hundreds of stainless steel to construct the stainless casings needed to build a 6 block tall distillation tower. Which also came with some energy hatches and fluid hatches and maintenance hatches and blah blah blah. All that was left to do, was to build the distillation facility next to the oven and make the tower drink all of the coal tar. Apparently, by distilling coal tar, I can get naphthalene and creosote and hydrogen sulfide and a drop of phenol. Three of these were useful. And it was not hydrogen sulfide, which shall be eliminated from reality. 
The rest are stored in super tanks. This naphthalene will be used for weeks later once I had to create polybenzaminazole. This phenol is phenol, but this creosote can be brewed with redstone to create practically finite but a lot of lubricant. Now that I had all the lubricant I needed to cut whatever I want, it was time to import it into the cutting machines in the clean room, which shall be done with the matter energy system. It was time to move on to creating extreme circuit boards. Which is basically just annealed copper on top of annealed copper on top of carbon fibers on top of epoxy resin. Thankfully I already had all four of these. I just had to put them all together in a brand new clean room certified processing chain. Now all I had to do was make a few extreme voltage chemical reactors, autoclaves, fluent extractors, arc furnaces, and more chemical reactors. Which cost me approximately a lot of titanium and nano circuits. Anyways. In the first step, the matter energy system is used to import epoxy resin into this fluent extractor to get the fluent version of the resin. Some of this resin is cooked with carbon dust in this autoclave to get delicious carbon fibers. The carbon fibers are bathed in the leftover blood of the sacrificed epoxy resin to give life to the fiber reinforced circuit board, which is useless on its own. Now for the funny part. This copper is transported to this arc furnace along with oxygen to a knee lit. The resulting slightly whiter copper is then bent and foiled again. The circuit board is covered in copper and covered in acid and covered in copper and covered in acid to finally create the extreme circuit board. The home of the quantum circuit. But it was time to go further. Besides automatically making the green circuit board. I will automatically make nano CPUs. This will need even more extreme voltage machinery, ranging from extreme voltage laser engravers, more cutting machines, more chemical reactors, and more fluid extractors. This was severely straining my titanium resources, but I shall ignore that information until I felt like not ignoring it. The nano CPU flow process begins by engraving the average silicon wafer to create CPU wafers. Meanwhile, this fluent extractor was melting glowstone. This along with CPU wafers along with carbon fibers was reacted all together to build the nano CPU wafers, which is finally sent to this cutting machine to finally create the nano CPU chip. Finally. I finally did it. But this didn't change the tragic circumstance that I still didn't have quantum CPUs for the quantum circuit. The quantum CPU is created by combining a nano CPU with radon and infamous indium gallium phosphide. The explanation of the joke is this is a semiconductor with superior electronic velocity. But it needs indium, which is a byproduct of not one ore, but two ores. I needed to dissolve both sphalerite and galena in acid to get the thing that comes before indium. The indium concentrate. Fortunately I had both sphalerite and galena from micro minor missions, plus they were incredibly common ores on earth. To turn these into indium, I would need even more extreme voltage machinery. My titanium reserves had probably reached their limit. But indium was more important. So I created yet even more extreme voltage chemical reactors, extreme centrifuges, electrolyzers, pulverizers, and ore washers. Next I pilfered a mild quantity of each ore from my storage. The first step is to crush each ore and then wash them to get purified but crushed but purified ores. Next they shall be mixed with sulfuric acid imported from the matter energy system into this mixer, to produce this indium concentrate. Which was clickbait because this is blue. To get the actual indium I must for some reason add 4 aluminum on top of it, which shall magically create a small pile of indium. 4 small piles equals 1 normal pile. So basically I was turning 16 aluminum into 1 indium. This reaction also had a bunch of other random byproducts. My reaction to this reaction was to store all of the reaction byproducts in this drawer, which shall be connected to the matter energy system as well with a storage bus. Now it was time for the fun part. This indium is mixed with gallium from sphalerite processing and phosphorus from apatite processing, to get indium gallium phosphide, which shall be referred to as INGAP from now on because the full name was too long to say. Meanwhile, I put down yet another extreme voltage chemical reactor in the clean room. 
I took some raw nano CPUs from the nano processing line, threw some in gap on top, and put some radon from radium salt I harvested a few weeks ago. The result of this bizarre combination of materials, is the quantum CPU. AKA qubit CPU, but I will call it quantum CPU because quantum makes it seem more technologically advanced. But for some reason the quantum circuit also needed nano CPU chips. Not to worry however, because I had them anyways. With the extreme circuit board, platinum, quantum CPU, nano CPU, and a bunch of surface mounted devices, I assembled my first quantum processor. The first tier of quantum circuits counted as an extreme voltage tier circuit, which replaced the need to make the slightly more complicated nano assembly. The second tier of quantum circuits counted as an insane voltage tier circuit, which replaced the far more expensive nano supercomputer, which needed the preposterous lumium. In conclusion, quantum circuits would enhance my ability to do the action known as Greg Tech. So now, all that was left to do was to make auto-crafting patterns for the quantum processors and quantum assembly, so that my system could now make them on demand when I said so. With easier insane voltage circuits in my hand, it was time to invest in higher tier circuit making machines. With just a bit more iridium, a sprinkle of radon, and a hint of extremely expensive materials, I put together the insane laser engraver and the insane cutting machine which shall be put next to the circuit assembler on this insane voltage power grid. This shall do tasks two times faster than the previous tier of machines. And I shall now use them, to create even more circuit stuff. Here was the current circuit situation. The cheapest low voltage and medium voltage tier circuits were microprocessors. The cheapest high voltage circuit is the nano processor. And the cheapest extreme voltage circuit is the quantum processor. But what if, microprocessors could be made even cheaper? The current method to create microprocessors included making all of these electronic components and CPUs. But since I had insane voltage circuit assemblers, I had unlocked the dark art, of system on chip electronics. Using just a circuit board, and soak, and a metallic few fine wires and bolts, I could create twice the amount of these microprocessors, at an insane material discount and very slightly insane time discount. So I would first get a ridiculous amount of soak chips, by etching my collection of silicon wafers under this colorful lens, and cutting the resulting wafers into tasty system on chip chips. Next, I destroyed the old auto-crafting recipes for the microprocessors and replaced them with the new, cheaper, soak-based recipes. Which only needed the extra items of copper and red alloy fine wires and bolts. And bolts were easily made in an extruder with a bolt shape. Now I could manufacture low voltage and medium voltage circuits easily. But after revolutionizing my circuit process, I felt as if all purpose in life had drained out of me. There was non-entity unexpended to do. But after searching the quest book, it dawned on me. The vision of the biggest, most expensive multi-block ever built, dwarfing the entire oil refining quadrant. A multi-block capable of assembling the most complex and cutting-edge technological objects out of the most complex and cutting-edge technological object. This assembly line, is called, the assembly line. The solid steel casings and laminated glass on the outside were tranquil to create. The real issue were the assembly line control casings. Necessitating extreme voltage circuitry and insane robotics and cutting edge alloy materials. The main things that I did not possess were the infamous Ruridit alloys from ruthenium and iridium, and high power integrated circuit components, requiring indium gallium phosphide and vanadium gallium and blah blah blah. By now I had processed all of the Sheldonite I repurposed from the end dimension, giving me hundreds of iridium and ruthenium, to be mixed together infamously to create the infamous Ruridin. Now for the hard part. Waiting for all of these to smelt in the blast furnace. I had anticipated this long wait, so I had gone ahead and prepared some high power integrated circuits. This required vanadium gallium which is obviously a mix between vanadium and gallium, both of which I already had from processing common ores left over from the old days of mining on earth. After this vanadium gallium is smelted, it is melted, 
which rhymes so it must be true. The problem is that molten vanadium gallium is supposedly over 4000 degrees hot, which cannot be handled by any fluid cell ahead on me. So I will bypass this was a thermal expansion fluid tank, which had no concept of temperature at all. The high power integrated circuit is then made in a chemical reaction between one normal pick, molten vanadium gallium and indium gallium phosphide. The resulting circular object shall then be lacerated for the equiangular quadrilateral H variant of pick wafers. This was the final thing I needed for the insane voltage energy hatch. By why make one, when I can make two of these? Two insane voltage hatches were enough to upgrade this blast furnace to ludicrous voltage tier, granting an additional smelting speed boost due to more overclocking. With this, instead of taking 5 million years to smell the word it, it would only take 2 million years. The good news is that as a result of this ludicrous voltage adventure, I had enough leftover hick rectangles to make all the assembly line casings I needed. All I had to do next was manufacture all the circuitry and machine parts for the assembly line parts. Now that the assembly line was assembled, it was time to face approximately 9 new issues caused by the assembly line. The first issue is that the assembly line was deluded into thinking it was not completed. And I had no clue as to why it would not work. So there was only one way to solve this. It was time to destroy stuff and place stuff in random spots until it worked again. When this didn't work, it was time to reevaluate what I was actually doing. I studied the assembly line and memorized all its intricacies exactly. Which made the assembly line work. Now for an explanation of how the working assembly line works. This current assembly line has 11 ultra low tier input buses, each capable of holding exactly one, aka one, item. Therefore it can handle all manufacturing tasks as long as they took less than 12 different parts. There are also a few fluid hatches in case the assembly line needed lubricant or polybenzamidazole. Which are needed to assemble the highest tier circuitry and perhaps create the ludicrous voltage tier machine parts. Even though these were a single tear above current insane voltage cutting edge technology, these were a massive leap in difficulty to establish, requiring soldering alloy requiring antimony plus high speed steel type S and polyphenylene sulfide and niobium titanium and magnetic samarium in all different shapes and sizes and forms and figures and magnitudes. All needed to make only the most basic ludicrous voltage part. The ludicrous motor. Which I severely and drastically needed. Anyways I had good news. The first material to deal with was magnetic samarium. The final tier magnet above neodymium. But just like neodymium, samarium was a byproduct of centrifuging rare earth. And since I had done the action of centrifuging rare earth, I already had some raw chemical element number 62 dust. This had to be smelted into a rectangular prism, making it suitable for polarization. Fast forward 7.5 seconds, and I had magnetic samarium. Which shall be extruded into a long rod. Now for the main ingredient. High speed steel type S this was basically high speed steel type G but with iridium and osmium sprinkled on top. Luckily I had some leftover amounts of all of these from previous industrial incursions. And HSSG was cheap anyways. So I mixed all of these materials together according to plan. And while I was waiting for all of these to smelt, I moved on to making niobium titanium wires. A ludicrous voltage tier cable. 
The real issue wasn't getting niobium or titanium since I already had accumulated ridiculous amounts of both of them from processing tantalite and ilmenite ores. The final tiers of cables needed one last layer of insulation on top. In the form of polyphenylene sulfide. As the name implies, this requires sulfur in some sort of circular molecule made of hydrogen and carbon. But making it was about the same difficulty said than done. This PPS process shall be handled by several high voltage chemical reactors, and a singular fluid solidifier to solidify PPS into usable sheets, as well as one bending machine to use the sheets to make more usable or foils for insulation. Since the process also made a few chemical byproducts such as salt, I gathered a few more electrolysis as chambers to separate the byproducts into raw usable chemicals. The first chemical reaction to make polyphenylene sulfide is to react benzene from oil with chlorine from salt, to make dichlorobenzene with a byproduct of hydrochloric acid. This acid shall be separated to regain half of the chlorine used. Meanwhile, I used the infinite sodium I had from my clay processing and infinite sulfur from processing hydrogen sulfide from oil, to combine sodium sulfide. This is thrown together with dichlorobenzene to create polyphenylene sulfide with a pinch of salt. This salt shall be separated as well to get back the other half of the original consumed chlorine. This PPS is then solidified into yummy sheets and quadrupled into foil insulation. And in the middle of while this was happening, all the high-speed steel type S had smelted, so sometime after that but still while this was happening, I smelted some niobium titanium in the background. The final material I had to cook. Now that I had PPS insulation, ludicrous voltage cables, magnetic samarium, high-speed steel type S, and a hint of ruthenium iridium alloy left over from making the assembly line, I could bend these into a variety of wires, fine wires, gears, rods, and other aforementioned shapes. But while it was true that I had all the ludicrous material parts, it was false that I could make the ludicrous motor. Because alongside solid thingies, I needed liquids to make this motor. The first one was lubricant. This was not an issue since I already had Google Plexa China amounts of lubricant from coal tar distillation. The real issue was the second but also final liquid I needed. And the second but also final liquid I needed, was soldering alloy. The explanation of the joke is that from now on, tin was not strong enough to weld objects together. I would have to mix tin with some lead and the relatively rare element known as antimony from Sib Nitor, to make soldering alloy mix. Which has to be smelted as well. Which has to be melted as well. This molten solder is then injected into the assembly line through an input hatch, and the lubricant I needed is imported into a second hatch through this export bus. Now for the grand finale. Putting each motor ingredient in each input bus, which led to the assembly line activating. After doing the action of waiting 270 billion cycles of radiation produced by two levels of cesium-133, the assembly line provided me, with the ludicrous motor. The first of many. And I did not even get to the nightmare of making ludicrous steer robot arms. Anyways, this concludes step 1 of phase 3 of stage 2 of part 6 of advancing towards ludicrous voltage machinery. By this point. I had reached a point that I was reasonably satisfied with. So in the next episode, I would focus on something else that was even more ridiculously challenging. The search for the rarest material in Minecraft. Nakwada. <laughs>